but it is you are you made transitions from traditional you know, prosumer cameras made by Sony and Panasonic, and now you've moved into a camera that's like a still camera, a 7D, and ha has these kinds of changes, do these affect how you shoot and the way you, you see in your films, or is it just, uh, just a tool and, and essentially you end up with the same place you would no matter what camera you have? Well, I, for me, I'm, I'm much happier now. I mean, uh, I, I wanted to do these big esoteric projects right out of out of college that no one wanted to give me money for because at that time the only thing that seemed worthwhile to shoot on was 35 millimeter uh, film and you know it's very expensive and the cameras are huge and, uh, and I wanted to go off to a steel town in Siberia and, uh, and make a film you know uh, as, my, as my first uh, feature project and it was really the, 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 the technological innovation that allowed me to make my own films without having to ask anybody for any money. Uh, so I could just do what I wanted. So in a way, uh, to me, the, it's the economics of it, uh, not the not necessarily the size of the cameras that are just as important. Because uh, you know, I'm not I'm not a person who loves to go out and get you know write grants and do fundraising and all that. I have an idea for a project that I want to do and I want to go and do it, and I don't want to have to ask permission for anybody or get money from anybody to do it. So nowadays, uh, you know, if you can do everything yourself and you can buy a, you know, a $2,000 camera, then it's within your grasp to make a movie. Uh, so I think that's the most important thing, I think. I mean, you know, I, I still love the, you know, the, the documentaries that were shot back in the, in the 20s and 30s and, you know, on, uh, in, in silent on black and white. I think those are still the most fantastic looking things that were, that were done in documentary. But, uh, but you know, now maybe uh, with uh, the super cheap technology starting to approach that quality of, uh, of, of uh, cinema, that of the, the look of cinema that we all kind of, I'm sure, have adored for a long time. That uh, you know, maybe those kinds of films will start to happen again. I notice you're 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 moving to widescreen. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, my, I love I'm, that. I, I, I'm a student <laughs> from a cinemascope, and I I've, I've been wanting to, to get back to it. Yeah. So soon you'll, your your Pakistan film may be a widescreen film. The truth is that I, I really so I, I really hate the way most documentaries look, you know, because the uh, the the way that people have had to shoot documentaries just means that they don't really attract the eye in the same way that uh, you know. I mean, I, I grew up uh, loving fiction film. In fact, I, my first fiction films were I saw here in this theater, and you know, about 31 years ago, uh, uh, Chaplin and all this kind of thing, and I. That's uh, as far as the the look of things. I've always kind of loved the look of fiction, but the uh, the uh, the the exploration of documentary. So I'm I want to combine those things, I guess. Well, in, in the film, there's a, there's a bit of context because there's a, the the uh, imam or the the spiritual leader of that uh, movement in the town gives a speech where the, he says we're going to go clear the the market of uh, the sinning of, the, of alcohol somewhere. So. So it's explained what they're about to do before they do it. Yeah. Well, let's talk a bit about um, events <coughs> being out of control. You know, J Joan talked about loving this idea that unstructured situations where events are out of your control. Um, how did this feel here? Well, I mean, you're kind of walking a tightrope, um, you know, with these guys because uh, they're. You know, uh, on the one hand, they they like to be filmed. Um, they film themselves all the time. Uh, you know, and uh, for them, I guess it's kind of like an episode of Cops or something. You know, they don't think they're doing something wrong. So, but on the other hand, they, in the back of their mind, they kind of know that uh, you know this foreign filmmaker who's filming all this stuff probably is going to take this and show it to people who don't agree. Uh, with their point of view, so there's a there's a, a nervousness in that. I mean, I've been filming uh, the Medi Army for probably six months or something. But more. you were not a foreign filmmaker; you were an American. Well, right, I was an American. Yeah, but I mean, you know, if, uh, in after a while, it kind of becomes all the same. Like to them, everyone is, you know, uh, basically an Israeli spy. You know, at the end of the day, like all the foreigners. <laughs> so uh, uh, you know, depending on who you're talking to, but. Um, yeah, that was a tricky one. I, I was worried that you know maybe someone would get killed in front of me, and then what would I do? Or 
you know, uh, uh, a few months after I filmed this scene, uh, a friend of mine was actually kidnapped by these same exact guys in that same exact market and held in that same exact room, blindfolded with the, the scraps of their, you know, their uh, banners uh, in exactly the same way that those people were. And he was held, you know, for 10 days in the marshes. And, you know, and he's a guy just like me. He's an you know, American filmmaker. So, uh, I mean, it's... Uh, but when you're when you're in the moment, you're just thinking, uh, you know, this is very interesting. Uh, I hope that I can film the scene and get my material out of it and cut it into something. And actually, uh, now because of the way technology has changed, I actually edited a version of the scene, which is very close to what we see on the screen, uh, within a couple days of having shot it. So I was able to remember exactly what it felt like to be in that moment. If you just ra watch the, the raw footage, it goes on for you know forever, and it seems like this long, plodding, boring thing, but you know, when you're in the moment of it, uh, it, it has this kind of uh, staccato uh, uh, pulse to it and uh, uh, this adrenaline and, you know, and I'm trying to get that into the, into the editing. And I suppose this is where people would start to have arguments you know, with the, uh, the technicalities of documentary and is it true and if you're cutting back and forth to this woman who's arguing with the guy outside but that you know, happened an hour later you know, but you're cutting back and forth as if it's happening in parallel in time. You know, these are the kind of technical questions that a lot of people get concerned with. But for me, uh, you know, uh, it's true enough. I would be concerned that I couldn't get the, that you were cutting in in the country with all of this going on around you, and that the, the, the very footage you were working with would be vulnerable to somebody arresting you. Well, no, not really, because at that time there wasn't any functioning government in Iraq. And uh, what I've learned after getting kicked out of two governments with functioning governments, uh, I mean two countries with functioning governments, is that it's really much better to work in a country that has uh, no government. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think about that, Nasco? 